and it's certainly a fine, fine beast. This is the Hasselblad 500CM and is an absolute classic of medium format photography. This particular camera belongs to the college that I'm working for at the moment. Last time I worked there, I borrowed it and I have a photograph of my daughter, who then was four, uh, kind of using the camera uh, out on a photographic job that we did doing some landscape photography. If you've seen my YouTube video on Avebury, you'll know that I was greatly influenced by the work of the landscape photographer Faye Godwin. And although this wasn't the book that, of hers that I got first, this book has massively influenced my photographic career. Most of the uh, shots in this book are in the square format because they were shot on a camera almost identical to the one that I'm looking at today, the Hasselblad 500. So if you want a book on photography, this won't tell you how to take the pictures but it will inspire you to take better ones. The Hasselblad is a modular camera. So the first thing I'm gonna do is take it to bits. Essentially, we have a body, a lens, a film holder, and in this case, a pentaprism viewer. Let's see what it looks like in bits. The heart of the system is the body, and this is deceptively simple looking. I've basically got a box with a mirror in, and if I remove the focusing screen, it becomes even more apparent that it's a box with a mirror in. It does, however, have the crank to wind the film forward, and it has the shutter release. distinctive noise that Hasselblads make, the double clonk noise, is actually the noise of the mirror coming up and then going down again. It's nothing to do with the shutter of the camera because the shutter isn't in the body. Having considered the body, let's put the lens back on set. Inside the body there's a red mark here which matches a red mark somewhere here. And the lens clips into place. The lens controls the focus. Also the shutter speed, which is the outside ring and the apertures. As you can see, as I turn them, both the aperture and the shutter speed changes. To change one instead of the other, I have to pull this ring down here, and now I can change the shutter speed. There are some other controls on the lens as well. Here's my flash socket, and I have a setting for X and for M. X is for electronic flash and M is for flash bulbs. The reason there are two settings, as so many older cameras, is that flash, uh, electronic flash operates quite differently from bulb flash. In electronic flash there's an, an, a huge spike of light very very early on. In a bulb, because it has to burn the filament inside the bulb, the, there is a slow burn which peaks more like a compressed sine wave. The other control here is V. V in this case is for time. If I push this lever up and move the camera over, now the camera is now set for timer and the timer value on this is 8 seconds. As I said before, the clonk clonk noise is the body. The little click at the end was the lens. 
The only other thing we need to worry about on here is what amounts to a depth of field preview. So if I press this button here, the lens shuts down. This button, of course, is the release for the lens. This camera has an unmetered pentaprism. Uh, other finders are available. Uh, my particular favorite is the waist level finder, uh, which I used on this camera previously, um, but this is what I've got today. This simply slots into place here. And now we have what's beginning to look like a camera. Explain a bit about the pen prism. All lenses invert the image. So what's at the top of the image ends up on the bottom of the film. The 45, mil um, 45 degree mirror inside here sends the image from the top to here and then up to this part of the pentaprism. So this mirror turns the image the right way up. If you look at it through the, va uh, the waist level finder, you will see an image which is the right way up. However, it will be the wrong way, wrong way round. Left is right, right is left. So what the pentaprism does is inverts that so that we actually see through the viewfinder what we imagine we'd see if we look through the lens. Actually, it's slightly different, but we get what we would expect, and that's the important thing. The last part of the exercise is putting the film in. This is the film holder. This bit here is a slide. And this is very important. Many people lose these. Now, at this stage, I turn this lever here, and I turn it a few degrees, and the whole of the back comes off. This is my film insert. The first thing I've got to do is move this reel here. It's very easy to see where the, uh, the film has got to end up because it has this little nerdy bit on it. If I just push down on this side, I can take out the film. I'm going to swap it over, push down on this side, and it inserts there. I can still lift this a bit, which is important because I need to put the film in this side. The film uh, on a 120 film has a, a backing paper so I unreel the backing paper and I very carefully move it across here on the outside and I insert the end of the backing paper into the slot here and you can see I can reel it up. When I'm secure, when I'm certain that the film is attached properly and as I pull here this end moves then I can put this back into the cassette. back, turn it down, and then I need to reinsert the slide. Until I saw someone do it, it never occurred to me that someone would try and put this the wrong way around. The handle goes in this direction, not this direction, this direction, and you can tell that by the curve of the metal. So now your film is loaded and it's ready to go onto the camera. As a Hasselblad only takes 12 shots, as it says here, uh, then sometimes people prefer to use more than one back at a time. And rather than change the films, which can be a little bit of a faff if you're out in the field, it, they just carry more backs. The reason it's got 12 here is that 120 film takes 12 shots. It used to be the case that you could get a film which was twice as long, which was 220, so this number here would say 24 and there was a slight difference be between 12 exposure backs and 24 exposure backs due to the length of the film that was in them. These days of course we're using 12 exposures uh, so this camera had it got a film in it will be now ready to go.
This can, last bit can be a bit awkward, but it improves the practice. There are clips here, which have to go together. And it's as simple as that. When I want to release the film back, there's a button here, which I depress, and that allows me to take the film back off. The last thing I have to do is make sure that I'm wound onto the first shot before I actually start. So this little winder will go around until I get to the first shot. Although it would have helped if I'd done it the right way around the first time. Wind that back, tick it in the corner, and I am ready to go. Best camera in the world? Yeah, for my money it is, to be honest. You can keep your 5D Mark IV, you can keep your uh, Nikon 850. If I had an unlimited supply of film and the time to work in the darkroom, match this up with a DeVere and nothing is going to beat it. Well, unless you get to a 5x4 or an 8x10, but that's a different story.